Okay, I'm just checking whether we're always on or always off here, folks. Well, welcome everybody. I'd like to call this uh, Council Committee of the Whole meeting for February 6, 2023 to order. And we have a, actually a pretty full agenda tonight. Um, with the Council's indulgence, I would like to, to reverse our discussion items so we can devote the majority of our time to item B, Ordinance uh, 23 1263, creating a new chapter. 1254 of the Lake Forest Park Municipal Code, code retaining walls. Does anyone have any objections? Okay. And with that, we'll start off with citizen comments. Is there anybody that would like to make public comment at this time? Um, podium is available to you if you would like. Three minutes, please. And Mr. Stedden, please. One minute. <laughs> Three seconds. <laughs> we'll go the other way. My name is Jess. I think at one point I'm going to find a picture. I have to just talk. Yeah, I'm going to go to the Oh, sorry about that. They're taken, you know, in other locations and you have a map so you can see where all this is. And the other thing is we've been sort of, because we don't have our own noise ordinance, we're relying on um, Sound Transit to implement 
um, or how or washed out to implement the FHWA noise analysis. And this apparently comes into play when, when you have substantial vertical alteration, a project that removes shielding, therefore exposing line of sight between the receptor and the traffic noise source. This is done by either altering the vertical alignment of the highway or by altering the topography between the highway noise, traffic noise, and the source of the receptor. And then there's another one. The next one that's a point that I think we also fall into is the addition of a through traffic lane. This includes the addition of a through bus or through traffic lane that functions as a high capacity vehicle lane, high occupancy lane, toll lane, bus lane, or truck climbing lane. And then the third one is restriping existing pavement for the purpose of adding a thoroughfare traffic lane or an auxiliary lane. So I think for those reasons alone, we have we belong in the FHWA noise compliance zone, and that's been ignored. And when you actually look at the study, so I, I sent it to you by email, and I realized it was hard to read in an email, so I made it into a PDF and sent it again, sorry for the duplication, but also gave you a handout. And you can see where things are taken. Um, for example, along Bothell Way, the only thing that's really taken is way down, you can barely read this thing, but it's around 150th, is there, yeah, 150th Street is where they took it on Bothell Way, um, not in the residential area. When they took it on 39th, they took it actually at a, really almost a block away behind the houses at 162 something. So again, it's not a true reading of where this is happening. And even the one that was on Both Away, it was taken from behind the building. So there's a lot of weird stuff in this noise study in terms of how they actually got their numbers. And I would like you to, there's like 95 pages, but only seven really relate to us. And those are the seven I would like you to study because you will see that the noise study that was done was very flawed and that we deserve better is what it gets down to. Our community deserves better. And this project feels to me like it's really being rushed without a lot of careful thought. It could be done well. I support the BRT, but I also support good design. I support thoughtful design. I support critical thinking. And I think all of you do too. And it's the time that we start applying this to this project. Thank you. Let's see next. Um... Thank you. I keep forgetting these were not automatic. Go on. All look good. Welcome. Hi again. I am too. Also, I've also read that study, and I've also contacted three separate noise and vibration companies to get my own analysis done because I my property is a little bit different because I have the trifecta of soft slope and it's moving very close to me, et cetera. And they all have agreed that vibration coming from the roadway does affect slip. It does affect all of those things. And to say that there is, because of there's no noise ordinance, they don't have to follow a certain code. That's what that study says. And I find that very troubling because we're gonna be affected even though we don't have a noise ordinance, it's very easy to implement a noise ordinance. There's a, a, lot, of, a lot of local cities have the same no, noise ordinance, for example, as Seattle. It's a, very, it's a very concrete noise ordinance. It could be mandated very quickly before, since this study doesn't appear to be valid, since it's going on, it's for, for expanding to the east, it's very possible that it could be implemented before they have to redo something for going on the west. And as far as the DB levels at my place, I have a DB because you know I have to worry about noise. The decibel levels inside my building in with, you know, just like yesterday I was recording, I was at 72 decibels as traffic was going by. So that's already high. And there is no, there is no noise study by my property. And my property can be affected like anybody else's that's close to the slope by vibration when they move the road closer. So I also support transit, but I also support, as Vicki says, good design. And good design does not put uh, these properties in jeopardy because where is the benchmark? Do I have to get a benchmark of my property in order to prove to sound transit that I might have a problem? So those are my concerns. And I think that a, a full-on study for moving things to the west side should be performed just for the safety of the community. 
because I also feel that things are rushed. And if they're rushing this particular piece, they could be rushing other things and that could have serious impact to the residents. So that's why, yes, they are in a hurry, but they're also being a little bit careless, maybe not intentionally, but maybe, you know, it was COVID they're, they're, they're everybody separated by COVID protocol and people can't get together and, and do good design. So that's what I'm for is to have something good. So the project will be successful. Thanks. Uh, let's see. Next we have Julie Cruz. Sorry, no. Oh, okay. I'm just here as a cheerleader, not a <laughs> I, I didn't mean to sign that form, sorry. <laughs> no, you're fine, no worries. Uh, and how about your significant other? Yes. That's me. Oh, okay. There we go. We have it backwards. Hi, I'm John Drew, uh, 10 year resident of Lake Forest Park. I'm at 16136 41st Avenue Northeast. And I'm here to comment about the retaining wall ordinance. Uh, which I wholeheartedly support, and I appreciate your efforts to move it through the process. But I feel that I have a to make a small request for a, what I think is a modest modification to the ordinance, <clears throat> and that is that I feel that the design guidelines should include mitigation for noise pollution that might result from the use of highly reflective retaining wall materials. In situations where developers propose to construct tall, long retaining walls at the cost of removing trees, vegetation, and other naturally sound absorbing materials, the guidelines should simply ensure that sound absorbing materials, treatments, or vegetation be incorporated into the design of the retaining wall. Uh, some visual design features already in the ordinance, such as landscaping and vegetation support sound absorption but noise mitigation is not specifically called out. In lieu of any mitigation, developers should present evidence that proposed retaining wall constructions will not produce additional significant reflective noise pollution. In closing, I hope we can negotiate a more lightweight 522 BRT design that doesn't sacrifice so many of our trees for tall con concrete walls with etchings of trees. Thank you. Thank you. Sorry. We had automatic ones last week then, or the week before, and, and we're shifting because we're in a more personal setting, apparently. Anyone else would like to make public comment at this time? Please. Scott? Yeah. Sorry, I wasn't going to speak, but uh, I... My name is Scott Messick, um, Lake Forest Park resident. Uh, I 100%, you know, I think the ordinance is, is great. I appreciate you guys going through with that. I guess my only, my only concern is I, I feel like we're adopting it after the fact and kind of changing the rules. And I want to make sure that well, how we do it and how we implement it isn't going to be something that Sound Transit sees as, um, I don't know, in, in, in kind of a stop Sound Transit viewpoint um i don't know how you do that um but that is my concern is how the it would be viewed in the eyes of sound transit so i'll have to say thanks thank you scott anyone else we covered everywhere this is mr mayor this is the second time we've had a more than one person in the council chambers is, <laughs> thanks everybody for coming okay let's move on with uh we're going to move start with uh Item B in reverse order here. So ordinance uh, 23-1263, uh, creating a new chapter 12.50 of the Lake Forest Park Municipal Code retaining walls. And I wanted to start out by thanking Mr. Bennett and our legal team, Ms. Pratt as well, uh, and her staff for making a very, very quick turnaround on this, Steve. This is outstanding work. Thank you very much for that. Yeah. Please. So should we walk through um, the changes since uh, the last version that was a, uh, your your um, January 26th uh, meeting? We, uh, based on the comments um, from, from council members, uh, we made um, a few changes to both the regulations and the um, design guidelines. And um, 
the uh, uh, this current draft is is up on the screen uh, for anyone who doesn't have it before them. Um, but so going right to the first change since the previous draft, that would be um, section one of the uh, ordinance, and um, at the the changes here were designed to address two sort of themes that were running through the comments. Number one being that um, the, 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 the draft, or initial draft language was uh, providing some um, uh, more flexibility with the type of wall that would be allowed than council members seem to be comfortable with. So we've really restricted it to just um, uh, a, a, a concrete construction or engineering um, block, I think is the other term that's still here. But so we've taken out the ability to use uh, timber or concrete laggings. Um, and, and the other thing that's uh, tried to address here was uh, the discussion, there, there wasn't really anything that uh, addressed sort of does, you know, does, does the construction, is it continuous? Does it, is there some point at which the construction could change uh, lower or higher, and and so instead of getting into maximum minimum heights, um, the the attempt here is to just say that the whole thing has to be of the same uh, construction type, uh, and then so so and if it is tiered, uh, that the uh, the that also all has to be the same type of construction, um, and thereby hopefully make that clear. And so you know there there probably is some still some work that be could be done on on defining exactly what is an independent wall segment. Uh, and, but, you know, it, uh, worst case, we could define that term just to, to make it clear if there, we don't come up with a better term. Um, the next change. Steve, uh, could I yeah. interrupt you? Pardon me. Um, and colleagues, I was remiss in not um, checking in on how you would like to approach this. Um, we can approach it on a change by change basis and then come back to more thematic changes that you're looking for, or what's what's your pleasure? How would you like to approach this? Ordinance. I think as a whole, and then design guidelines as a whole would be useful for me. Okay, any other thoughts? Does that work for a bit? That works. Okay, great. Thank you for that. Okay. My apologies. No Mr. problem. Bennett, please. Um, then the next change uh, in section three was just a, a wording change suggested by the city attorney. So I did not include an explanatory note there. And in section four, um, the draft design guidelines, uh, the new version of it makes landscaping mandatory. It was an alternative under the previous draft. Uh, so now uh, this language in four just parallels that, uh, making it clear in the ordinance uh, that uh, the retaining, uh, that landscaping treatments uh, would be required. Um, and would also have to be approved by the public works director. Then in section five, uh, which is a new new five, uh, section four is a, a new section. Section five is moved down to um, address some some sort of. You know, we didn't really have anything in here that that uh, sort of dealt with those unforeseen circumstances or unique cir circumstances that come up uh, as a project comes to uh, you know you get farther and farther along with design. So. Uh, in a lot of our regulations, uh, we, we have the ability for the, the the administrator of the regulations to set conditions. And so we've just put in um, a couple of um, typical conditions, especially when you're dealing with landscaping, understood from the discussions we wanted. Uh, the council was concerned about having permanent irrigation, so we're limiting um, this to temporary irrigation and then uh, some sort of performance uh, plan implementation of, of three years, uh, and you know the, there was some discussion about is, is that typical for 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 plantings? It is kind of that's that's some of our other regulations. A three year plan uh, is typical when it comes to monitoring plans, like when we're dealing with uh, critical areas. Those are typically five year plans, uh, but that's that's because you're trying to fight invasives and things like that. So. This is, you know, just a, a starting place for, um, uh, for for that discussion, and uh, we certainly can talk about it more. So those are um, the suggested changes to the um, the ordinance. Do you want to stop there and talk about them? Okay. 
Thank you. A um, couple of comments uh, in item one with the rockeries and timber and concrete laggings. Um, would that language preclude us from using any of the green wall systems that are set up similar uh, to uh, similar in that kind of wall construction type? Um, <clears throat> I don't think in that section, uh, the, 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 gu the guidelines, I think, talk about an actual type of wall. So, so the question would be, how, how would you meet the first guide, first provision, that it will have artistic images, you know, et cetera, et cetera, Northwest theme uh, with, with just a green wall. So, so you know, it's, it's kind of in guideline language um, so that, you know, you, we could, when we get to the guidelines, maybe that's where you see if there's, you know, flexibility enough to allow that and still do this. But, but I think if you were just look at this document, you'd say, well, they're looking for a concrete wall whatever, whether it's um, pre-cast or, or cast in place, uh, you know, that, that's what the city seems to be saying. So, so you know, I think that's, that's an area where, you know, you, it, you, we could, you know, you could set up an alternative like we had before with, with landscaping and or, you know, but uh, that's, at this point, it's not really envisioned the way this is set up. Okay. I think uh, that's doing a disservice to our community. I think some of those green walls are phenomenal um, and beautiful and, some of them incorporate soil, so they're not a harsh um, sound reflecting concrete. And so I think that there's some really great benefits to them. There's obviously cost implications, things of that nature. But I just want to make sure that this this implies, as you said, that we have to have concrete first. Um, and I just want to make sure that there is an opportunity for us to have those other systems involved in here. Um, and then I think the only other comment I want to bring up at this moment is considering adding five-year monitoring for the trees. The trees are really hard uh, to get established and with our incredibly hot summers lately. Um, I think we want a longer establishment period for those, a uh, longer irrigation period if, if possible. Okay. Vice Chair Cassidy. Oh, it was off. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, and thank you, Mr. Bennett, so much for all the work on this. So uh, I actually have a question for my colleague and then we'll. <laughs> so the green walls that I've looked at look to look like they, they have some terracing in them, that they're concrete sure. that that then incorporates soil, you know, in in sort of sections as they go up. I'm so I'm curious if you're see, if you're reading this first section as not allowing that. I get it. Okay. I think we're gonna share. Um, yeah, because I think that the, the sense of laggings is how they are they're structured. They're they're lagging that uh, dirt wall back with the structure rather than building a a barrier structure. Um and and so. And it, it doesn't specifically discount it, but I would read this and not propose it because I would feel like it would not allow it. Okay, so I was wondering if tiered is, you see, I don't really know what lagging means. That's part of my problem. So is tiered something different? I think because maybe, I, can you clarify what your thought was with laggings and maybe that's could help us understand a little better because my thought was it's, it's not a solid structure. So when you have small incremental pieces, you usually have to lag them back and, oh, okay. and structurally mm -hmm. get them strength through the, the soil behind it. Is that what yeah, you're I, thinking? I, I guess my Is image of like lagging is what we looked at was that, you know, there are these um, concrete or, um, uh, you know, I-beam type of supports that are put in the ground and then wall is slotted in between them. But you know, I, I don't know if those always have to be lagged back or, yeah. uh, um, but we looked at the, we, we looked at a picture of something that, mm. uh, oh, I guess it was from um, one public work staff was showing me uh, what they were thinking about for a lag, uh, wood lag wall that was going to be associated with the traffic circle. Got and that's it. what it looked like. It was, it was being, you know, uh, columns, you know, pounded in the ground and then boards between them. Where some of the green walls that I have seen were terraced so that they stepped back and plantings were in the each step and grew up 
from each step. So, mm -hmm. but that seems like that would be allowed here because you allow terracing, right? You actually call out terracing. That, that may be another word we could add that would create some flexibility. We're just saying that uh, terraced or tiered, uh, tiered really meant that they were going to, to, to me, that meant they were going to do it in two sections or something like that. Oh. So, so up here is one wall just, but I, I don't know that the, you know, uh, slope doesn't always allow for that in, in some cases. So, no. um, so you, so you could, but, you know, you could just expand that with that type of language uh, in, in that section to, to possibly allow something that uh, is more in, in keeping with the green wall. Okay. Well, maybe we can work on that a little bit. And um, and then the other question I had, in the irrigation uh, section, you talk about funding. And so is the idea that the funding would come to the city and the city would be responsible for monitoring the, the actual function of the irrigation and make sure it keeps working throughout the year, the, the three years? Um, the the way that it's uh, handled um, usually is it's not necessarily that the city uh, is is doing that monitoring, but the city has uh, some sort of security that uh, if for some reason that monitoring stops, that the city could 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 then step in and and do it. We'd have the funds available to do it. So um, so that that's kind of what I was thinking about. Uh, there are some. Uh, technical technical issues, and so this is why um, you know the language is kind of broad related to public agencies. You can't require public agencies to bond. So, um, but what we you know we 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 have you know already we're, we're uh, you know setting up deposits, and or, so the other option is a um, what we call a um, not not a fee in lieu of, but a uh, uh, basically a, a bank account that's the the applicant and the city is named on, uh, and we give that back once the period's over. Okay, that's great. And and if I can just ask one more question. Absolutely. Okay. Um, so, um, I am interested in the noise issue and how we work that into um, our our uh, ordinance here. And I, I just don't know that we know enough about what it takes to mitigate noise to really prescribe at this point, but um, how about you? <laughs> Do you know how we might incorporate it into the ordinance? Well, well I you know, took a stab at that in the, the guideline section uh, that, that it at least should be discussed. And we could talk about that a little bit more. Uh, okay, let, but let's but we, have, we have to remember that what we're trying to do uh, I, I like the language that the gentleman said uh, the that were doesn't produce any significant additional noise because we're we're talking about a, a project that's coming into an existing environment where there already are existing impacts that that you can't hold an applicant to fixing. So well let, let's talk about that when we get to the guidelines. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, um, thank you. Um, I, I appreciate that you've taken the council's feedback on board from the previous meeting, and I appreciate that you're prioritizing vegetation. Um, I did want to ask about section four. Sure. Um, do you see, um, could you foresee a situation where there's a section of a wall that just for some reason cannot have any vegetation? It's, it's too inaccessible, that sort of thing. And if that is the case, would this section be too prescriptive in that it would effectively forbid the wall that they have to build? Um, I, I think that um, the idea, the, the way that this is set up is to um, say that the public works director, um, you know, can, if, if the what's presented is um, in keeping with the design guidelines, and the public works director can approve it. So, so you're you're immediately sent to the design guidelines, and so that's where kind of you have the flexibility uh, to 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 work with the situation that the applicant finds themselves in. And and so that's another reason I think you know when we look when we look at that section, we need to also look at at provision two. Uh, and there's some some example language there that I you know that. Is the kind of things you put in design guidelines, but you know I don't know if it's necessarily what you want. But that's really 
where the rubber hits the road is is how is that a should or a shell <laughs> you know that, that like we talked about when we were doing the town center design guidelines you know, you, you, that that's where you have your ability to, to dial it up or down okay thanks mm -hmm. mr goldman uh yes please mr fertani <clears throat> Thanks, Avi Mayor, um, and thanks, Steve, again for your uh, great report. Um, the uh, I, I had asked a question last time about the height. So um, I noticed there's no language in that. There's, so there's some commonly understood. What is the minimum height that this was the ordinance would cover? Yeah, that's um, I, you know, didn't really think that. I, I thought it'd be harder to agree on, you know, when this is triggered via height, mm -hmm. more so in terms of. You know the the nature of the project. This is a retaining wall in a um, uh, a right of way. Right, that's that's kind of you know where this is happening. And so if you're gonna you want to propose a new retaining wall, whether it's the city or another agency, then uh, regardless of how high it is, it has to meet these standards. Okay. So I, that's why I I thought it was just too uh, difficult to establish that minimum or maximum height because you don't really know what you're uh, if you set a maximum height, uh, then are you, you know, precluding something that you, you know, that the city wants to do because it went six inches over that? So uh, that that was my thinking about it in that first change. Thanks. Thank you, Mr. Pertani. Mr. Lebo. Uh, thank you. Um, it might be worthwhile looking at, like, for example, WashDOT standards. I do believe that they have a three-year plant establishment as a typical requirement for WashDOT right away for uh, landscape. So I would ask that we do consider uh, making that a requirement if, in fact, it aligns with what WashDOT typically does. And with regard to landscape, and I think it's really important that some temporary irrigation be part of that for um uh, the viability of the landscaping. And it, it would be uh, unusual that there's not some amount of space in order to provide some landscaping, particularly if it's a requirement. They they do already have the power to um, take. And so you don't need much space to actually uh, provide some vegetation. And the way you construct the wall and where the property line is can be um, can be modified in your design. Um, particularly given the height of the wall. So. Colleagues, any other thoughts I have before I chime in on this part? You know, something you said earlier, Steve, um, well, let's talk about drought, drought resistant plants. If I recall correctly, 30 years ago, when the last time that Southern portion of 522 was um, was changed. Uh, they put drought resistant plants in the median and they all died the first. <laughs> and I think the city held them accountable for that to making sure that that was, was taken care of. So I think it's, these comments are, I think are appropriate and everyone, I, I know you agree with this. The other thing, and the question of terracing and height, uh, as Mr. Fertani was uh, uh, in your discussion with Mr. Fertani, your comment, about town center process, the town center process, I think about we used a lot of a human scale. And I wonder if there's a way we can incorporate that either into the design part of it or this of, it's difficult to say it should be a certain height. I, I certainly recognize that, but we all recognize uh, something that's big and looming kind of. And so that human scale aspect of it seems like it might be appropriate to somehow intertwining the mix here. Um, and the other thing from the design standpoint, again, some of this is gonna be, is gonna be down below, but not, and not necessarily specifically in the ordinance part, but the um, terracing at, or tiering, if that's a correct way to, to phrase it, should be encouraged. When we talk about should or shalls, um, I, I think that that's another thing that I, I don't hear anybody su suggesting we haven't heard comments of people saying that they don't necessarily like terracing or breaking up the space of a wall. And I'm not sure where this fits in the mix, but from my standpoint, I think about if I'm walking along and I'm looking over, you know, is this wall, for example, human scale to me? It's maybe in the context of this wall over here it is, but if it was something a little bit lower or it was broken up through some trim or feature that mm -hmm. wouldn't 
bring the scale down in my eyes, it could be helpful, particularly in a situation where, um, you know, it, 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 it's going to be concrete. There's going to be a lot of asphalt and concrete and, and trying to bring the scale down and the, um, to a level that's more human oriented. Those are just my couple of comments. Anyone else here? And, and the last thing I wanted to say just really quickly too, keep in mind folks, we're probably gonna have one more touch on this in terms of time frame. So if we can avoid sort of kicking the can down the road, unless it's a technical item, let's, let's try to get it so that Mr. Bennett and Ms. Pratt have some dire clear direction from us, if that is acceptable to everybody. Tom, I have uh, some photos that I've asked if uh, Matt has a chance to share of the green wall sort of, and it dovetails very nicely into what you were talking about, but the human scale and the human sort of proportions. Uh, Matt, are you ready for that? Okay, thank you so much. Appreciate for being able to do this on the fly. So if you wanna just sort of scroll through slowly. So these are systems. So that's a system that's holding that retaining wall back you'll notice a fair amount of these have that human scale at the bottom and those are your standard uh, concrete you know rough face concrete blocks at the bottom so this is a very tall <laughs> um, uh, retaining area uh, if you want to move down to the next option uh, so this one kind of you can see against the back where the houses are above the road is below um, that is a little deeper so but it's just an idea of other places that have successfully used some form of green against roads if you'd like to go to the next one please matt this is really, this is a more active and engaged, you know, where you, it's a more traditional uh, installation of, of the concrete blocks there. So it's not as unusual for someone to put in. Um, and then one, I think I have two more maybe. So this one really intrigued me. It's very steep and it's held back. It's, but you can see there's sort of that um, human scale bottom base to it. And then you've got the green above and you can see the fence at the top because we know Sound Tribes that just loves fences at the tops of things. Um, and then I think the last one there, um, again, this one, again, higher end treatment at the bottom um, with the, the slate kind of look, but it gives you an idea. And these are systems that oftentimes have a lot going on behind it, you know, that, that that's stabilizing it. But what you're seeing for the most part in most of these is uh, there's dirt behind it and not that hard concrete. And even the few that have concrete, they're the blocks that are shaped so that they don't um, do a strong reflection. They tend to break apart sound when it hits it rather than a, a concrete wall, especially a concave concrete wall that will actually work as like a focusing of mm -hmm. sound. So these sorts of systems I think are great. I just want to make sure that these are not in any way um, not allowed in our code because I think this is when people think highway green, they're looking for things like this, not the kinds of things that we see bordering Highway 90 going up, you know, through Issaquah. It's like, this isn't Highway 90 through Issaquah. It's a, it's a great highway, but it's not that. And when I see these big concrete, even when they're beautifully stamped, and even the ones that are in Kenmore and Bothell, they just scream, I'm a highway and not, I'm in your neighborhood. And so this is, Again, this is my vision. I don't know how to make it happen, but I, I'd like to show my colleagues. This is what I like to show my colleagues. This is my thoughts. Thank you, Councilman Riddle. Uh, colleagues, just on point, any comments about Councilman Riddle's um, green walls? Samples. If, if I may, please. yeah. Um, so I just am very curious about the steepness of it and what actually is growing on it and how it stays there and doesn't slip off <laughs> in a big rainstorm. So, you know, that that's what kind of worries me about this is like, wow, I mean, how steep is that? I can't really, mm -hmm. you know, because if, if one of the things that I think the balance that I think we probably have to worry about here is that the more the, as, as the as, the more vertical you are, the less taking there exactly. are. And, and so, you know, so we want to try to, to minimize the takings because these are our these are our neighbors' homes here that we're talking about. But so I'm more intrigued if you go up a little bit by that one that is sort of terraced. Next one, right yeah, there. Yeah, there. By that, because it seems like you could get the steepness, minimize the takings, but still get the green. So I don't, I don't, what, what do you think? 
Um, yeah, there's, there's links here to look at how they work. Um, I can share this with the council. Uh, I, think, I think you did. Uh, I think, oh, maybe, yeah. Yeah, I think maybe not the whole council. I'll share this with the whole council. Um, so I can't speak to each and every one. I've not personally used any of these. So this is not coming from that personal experience, unfortunately. But um, some do require you to dig back and kind of do work behind it to stabilize, but then you infill it. It's so some of them are more invasive than others, but I, I agree. I think this one is, is a pretty decent intermediate option. Um, but it's just something from what I've learned from working with um, an interior acoustician, which is very different from exterior. But if you, the more you have facets on a space, the, the more the sound gets kind of dispersed rather than directed. Colleagues, other thoughts on topic? Mr. Lee. Um, I have built the uh, first example. Um, we refer to it as a burrito wrap wall. There, um, if you go up that one there, it's a highly engineered wall that you have to go back um, and you basically take a geotextile. No, you take a geotextile, you lay it out, you fill it with um, uh, soil and rock, and then you fold the geotextile back and you do this over and over again. And so what you see there are the individual um, wraps of the geotextile fabric, and then you can spray them or plant within the soils because what you do on the leading edge is you actually place soil for a, a growing medium and then back is some structural fill. Mm -hmm. And so the wall is engineered as layers of material, um, but all of the solutions require that you engineer back a certain mm -hmm. distance. And so you end up, Basic, you end up, the wall is actually much deeper uh, as in terms of the area that you have to take. They're nice. Um, it can in the right circumstances where you have the area to do it. It's uh, in the, where you have the area to do it and you can engineer it, it's actually less expensive. Um, yeah, uh, visually, I like these sort of green walls. Uh, my question for Director Bennett is, would these sort of walls be allowed under the current draft of the ordinance? No, I think you need to um, create, kind of go back to the format we had before, where you have, this is the, you know, one option, the, the one and two you have now, and then you would create um, maybe alternatively third provision or fourth provision that says, you know, you you could um, do this in place of complying with the the one and two provision. So uh, that would be great to hear if council wants to see um, that that is an alternative. Uh, but you know, you're you're basically saying that, um, and I think it would be better to because you could have a picture like this and and say this is you know as an alternative to one and two, you could you could do this, and you wouldn't need to do the graphics. Um, but yeah, we want to really kind of nail down the the um, terminology that maybe um, our council architects could help out. <laughs> so I, I guess kind of summarizing where I'm at, um, I, I like these. If it meant a substantial delay in us getting this ordinance passed, I'm not sure I like them that much. But if it gets a quick amendment that we could get for our third touch, I would be on board with it. Fair enough. I, just my my two cents worth. The one of the, the one that you and I both liked there that had the, the terracing, yeah, you know, that one there. That appears, and again, I'll, I'll refer to my experts here. That looks like just standard, or not necessarily standard, but CMU. It's like I mean, it's like basically a stacked block that's backfilled. And from my from my standpoint, I want to make sure that we're not getting giving. Um, letting them take an easy way out, and that is going to be less desirable than a finished product that might be done if it was actually cast concrete or something like that. Because that, to me, I love the aesthetics if I un unfocus my eyes, but it also reminds me of that giant CMU wall that they have up at Costco up, up the top of the hill as you go up 205th with nothing, too. I mean, if all those plants are gone, that's what it looks like. So I'm going to leave it to the experts to know whether the, which way we should go on this um, as an addition, but for what it's worth. 
factors. Um, yeah, I think I think the specific product is going to be challenging for us to to navigate. If at this at this point at this stage, I think that comes down to, um, it, you know, the engineering and all that. But I think if we can get this in as an option, new option three, which is in lieu of one and two, in lieu of giant concrete, and then plants climbing it, we could have this integrated composite green structure. I think the one thing that might be useful is the conversation about the sort of uh, human scale element, and especially with this one, because a lot of times these are kind of built with a, a base, sort of a human scale base. And then that also provides us some protection of if a car kind of comes off the highway, it has something solid and concrete to hit. And then the nice green wall would be above it, um, probably be more um, resilient, I maybe, and maybe I'm just imagining things, but that would be my thought. So I think a, a few technical tweaks, and I think we should do our best to try to get this in. Um, and I think Which that's it, yeah. Uh, just that uh, most of these are engineered walls and they do take a certain amount of distance behind them to, to be able to make that work. And so where you have, for example, you're not wanting to take up much area, you build a vertical wall. These these are engineered solutions. I mean, you could make an option there that says, you know, you can build a battered engineered soil wall. They're not going to do it uh, because it would require too much area, and too, too much expense to actually do it. You do it where you have the room. And I and I've built them, but and they're just. What's uh, your pleasure to align the traditional line with the right here? Please. Well, I I don't see any downside to putting in an option three that sort of invites um, alternative treatments that would increase greenness, you know, greenness, <laughs> increase um, green, <laughs> I don't know how to say that, and uh, noise mitigation. Um, and so, so that if such a thing were possible and available and they could do it, they have the option to do it, but kind of not spending a lot of time on this, but more Great. leaving it open for them to come with, with an idea that then, has to be looked at by the public works director and approved for use. Would that work? Yeah, Something I don't think it'd be that hard like to, that. to add a, a third, uh, uh, an alternative provision with a picture. And we, uh, if it's, you think it will be okay to use that um, picture, Councilmember Riddle, is that public domain? You think? Those are public domain, found them on the internet, pictures, uh, mm -hmm. you just- Yeah. Okay. Use them however you're allowed to, we'll, we'll, but yes, you may. We'll come up with something. <laughs> okay. The um, the first change in the guidelines um, is on the second page of that, that document. And um, so this is where the the guideline language changes to make landscaping mandatory uh, in the case of the um, uh, uh, the a wall that's complying with provision one that uh, it'd be a concrete wall it needs to have landscaping now uh, in this draft where it's written um, and then we're calling out that the plants have to be native uh, drought resistant species that do not require permanent irrigation. Um, and so then I've added um, some language that's typical in, in our Southern Gateway landscaping provisions. Um, and uh, the, the percentage there is just um, a placeholder uh, that, you know, seem doable based on kind of the, wall, the, the vegetation we see around us and other types of wa walls that are similar to what we're showing here um, that would be reachable, but it's also um, kind of couched in a should. So uh, this, you know, this would be, you know, this is kind of starting from a place of, uh, we, you know, we don't want to, um, you know, create an enforcement issue, uh, but it all, we want to set some sort of expectations of what, what we're looking for if they're going to go this option. So now in some ways, um, 
you know, having that also creates a little more incentive to do this new option we're talking about. Because if you have a green wall that's totally set up to, you know, uh, uh, to to be um, uh, always vegetated, uh, that may be an easier uh, thing to achieve. I, I don't know. That's just kind of off the top of my head. But so there's a, there, there's a couple of changes, a couple of things there that you could tweak, which is the you know, is a should or is a shall, and is it thirty percent uh, over thirty six months, uh, or do you want to you know bring that. Uh, down or, or take it up, um, you know, we, uh, the kinds of things that are in the, the, the Southern Gateway design guidelines are, are much more uh, ambitious and they've, they've created problems for, you know, because, you know, it's been pretty easy for people who want, that's not 80%. Some of them are 80% coverage within three years and it's really hard to get to 80%. So that's, that's another reason I sort of went to the other and that, that's a buffer between residential and the, you know, the Southern Gateway, the new residential there. So uh, difficult to achieve. Um, and then the only other change was this um, nod towards trying to address uh, sound attenuation. And uh, that that's on the last page of that document uh, and doesn't, doesn't get very specific. Another case where you could change the shell to a should, step back a little bit um, or, uh, you know, talk about it in terms of the idea that uh, the project shouldn't add to the noise uh, in, in the situation that it is occurring in. So, um, but yeah, then, then I think I think what I would suggest is uh, that the one we, the provision we just talked about, the new one would, would be a new number three, and then whatever we have for sound attenuation just kind of applies to everything. So, uh, questions? Alex, I'd like to start with number three because I think that's gonna be a little bit more tricky than the, than the other. Uh, so thoughts about sound attenuation. I really believe this is a critical component of this entire uh, system. Um, before I speak my piece, I'd love to. Mr. Lee. Thank you. I, I think it should be shall when it comes to issues of addressing sound and uh, particularly where we have hard walls like this and the diffusion of it. I'm also fine with the 30% uh, landscaping after three years. I think that's fairly doable. It means it's covered in 10 years or sooner. Um, I don't see it, but oftentimes these walls have some safety railing or some safety fence on top. Uh, can we make some provision that if they do, that it's perhaps a black vinyl coated uh, rather than just a standard galvanized? So it helps make it disappear. We um, we were <clears throat> hesitating to to get into specific uh, details like that because there, there could be you know ten years from now a, a, another product that's that's more more durable or or even you know uh, when we get final construction drawings for uh, the projects that are currently um, out there so um, you know I think number one the building code is going to kick in uh, that it's going to require of some kind of fence at the top. So I, I don't know if the council, I mean, I, it's certainly up to uh, you you all, but uh, the, the the question is, do you wanna get that specific or do you wanna add something um, specific that like to the provision that I, in the ordinance that says the public works director shall be uh, authorized to require, you know, some of these things or safety fencing. But, you know, do you, do you wanna really get you know, specific to a type of product, I guess is what I'm asking. Alex, thoughts on point. <laughs> <laughs> this is what we call hard coding in my world. And Mr. Bennett has deflected us away from that a lot when it comes to some of these land use codes. Ms. Riddle. I know that it would be a cost, but I think how how can we know that the that the system is going to do this without having some sort of acoustical engineering sort of report or something. So I guess I'm wondering if this is a design requirement, do we need to have a concurrent policy requirement to provide an acoustical engineering report on impact more specifically? Because I, I don't know how, if they came and said, yes, this works. I mean, we go through all of this, it builds it and it, it doesn't really impact I, or it's worse. So I guess that's my question to my colleagues as well. 
Mr. Ferratani. Thank you. And uh, Matt, do you have that uh, thing that I just sent you? Sorry, it, 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 it requires a uh, visual. Uh, There we go. All right, thanks very much. Um, so, um, you know, you're on city council when you start taking infrastructure pictures of other cities. Th this is this is Tokyo. And uh, I happen to see this uh, on a construction site. It, what the sign shows, it says in Japanese, is the ambient sound in decibels on the left and the uh, construction uh, sound uh, decibels on the right. And there's a municipal code apparently that says that you have to have these signs at these kinds of sites. And so I had a uh, thought that it might be interesting to try to have uh, these signs installed on large retaining wall projects. Um, the, our attorney said that we can't have two different topics on the same bill, which is reasonable. But I'm thinking that, you know, to, to address your point about how do you know if it's working, this might be a way to basically let it be completely transparent that this is, you know, what we're hearing here, right? And to um, to Councilmember Levo's point, um, agree about the uh, um, keeping the look correct. Um, I'm a little hesitant about just giving the public works director because we switch public works directors, hopefully not really soon or anything. Um, and uh, you know the, the interpretation may vary or does it vary very much from public works director to the next? Well, fence type, yeah, that could vary. <laughs> I mean, it, okay. so if you want, if you want, you know, vinyl coated chain link fence, then yeah, you can say it in the code. Right, but if we leave it to the the wording that you had, which is to say that the discretion of the public works director, is there sort of a, a generic thing that uh, public works directors think of when they think of what fits with the uh, community? Well, that's that's where your the guidelines could come in. You you could give the applicant and the public works director pictures of of you know acceptable types of fences mm -hmm. at the tops. Uh, so. You could have a picture of the vinyl coated chain link, or you could have a picture of Trex type fence. Uh, what you know? What um, they don't give them some options. Thanks, mm -hmm. Mr. Goldman. <laughs> Um, yeah, so um, I'm very happy that you included the sound provision. Uh, I think it strikes a balance that we definitely want it in there so that sound mitigation is not completely ignored. But I also think we shouldn't try to be too prescriptive and the amount of technical knowledge we would need to really have a lot of details, I think would slow the process down. So I think that strikes a balance. Also, it seems to me that the nature of this is someone's going to be applying for a permit to build the retaining wall. And so whoever is processing the permit would have to see that, oh, yep, you have considered sound attenuation. So it seems to me that there is sort of an enforcement in there that some city staff member would need to check to make sure that they didn't just rubber stamp some sort of cell, that they actually had something to confirm that. So I think as is, I think it covers what we would like it to cover. Uh, thank you, Councilmember Goldman, um, because that's that. Uh, I'm going to disagree with you a little bit, <laughs> uh, but because it sparked with me uh, something that I think um, we should ask for, and that is um, some documentation from Sound Transit as to the pretty much really what you were looking at there in Tokyo, the current uh, sound measurements and um, within a certain time frame after the, the completion of the project, you know, that, that they need to demonstrate that they've done their best. Mm -hmm. I, I'm not quite sure how to word this, Steve. Let me give it some thought here and maybe I'll come back to you in a few minutes, but... Uh, Okay, well, I mean, I, I think, you know, I, I, I can see it, something kind of coming just in, a, you know, another sentence here where you would say that, uh, um, you know, you keep the shell, town sound, sound attenuation should um, uh, be considered in the design process. Um, at a minimum, you keep that and then say, and uh, the applicant shall ensure that the project does not significantly increase um, sound levels uh, after construction. So, so that you've told the public works director and the applicant, they've got to show, um, you know, what the sound is now, what the sound is later uh, after it's constructed. So there has to be some sort of noise uh, report on, on what it is. So 
you can get more specific than that, but you, you put the process in motion um, by, by just saying that uh, without having to, you know, know what the ANSI standard, you know, for uh, noise or whatever, you know, the report is that you have to do. Now, if we, between now and the time you take this to council, I mean, take, take it to consideration of adoption, you, you know, if we find some standard uh, that, that that's not a huge change that you can, you can just add, you can be specified that it shall comply with, you know, so-and-so's uh, noise reporting uh, standards. Okay, thank you. That that's very helpful. I I just my feeling is that a, a little a little accountability is necessary in this particular circumstance. Okay. Thank you, Philip. Uh, and uh, and and also thank you for disagreeing with Councilmember <laughs> Goldman. First, it softens the blow, Larry. No, I I, I with respect, I. I, I I certainly appreciate the, the the spirit of what you're saying and and your thoughts. I I would like to see a little more accountability as well, uh, just partially because having seen what WashDOT has done in the past on this corridor and in other areas, uh, you know we do know unequivocally sound is is an environmental hazard if it's too high and and it really does. Um, have a direct relationship to people's quality of life if it's too noisy. There's all sorts of studies that show how how dangerous it it can be. So, I do I would like to see this to be stronger without being overly burdensome. Um, but at the same time, I want to put the um, the burden on the applicant to make sure that they're held accountable in this in this regard because um, it, it is important. I mean, you know, the fact that. Mercer Island gets to test out and Medina gets to test out quieter pavements and we don't says a lot about sound. And so I think that it's important for us to, to really kind of put it into a little bit more of a, of, of an equation kind of thing as much as we can without making it administratively impossible. So. Councilman. Yeah, I think in, in the same vein, um, I think also, if they, if I would like to see some sort of acoustical report or something or, or meeting an ANSI standard, I, I like before the construction, because once it's constructed, it's a little hard to come back and fix it. So I like the idea of having something in the application process that holds them accountable. And then afterwards, there's a validation of that. So my preference would be hitting it in both spots. Just a quick quick note a quick note for the public. Uh, Council member uh, Vice Chair Casover brought to us a revision of the noise ordinance a number of years ago, which I pig piggybacked on about trucks and vehicle heavy vehicles. And again, that's imperfect, but it, that was a place where we put a stake in the ground to say we've got to be cautious about the noise levels in our community. Council member, or Vice Chair Casover, excuse me. <clears throat> yes, um, thank you, Chair. Um, and thank you, um, Vicki, for giving us this handout because there is some data here that has been collected, but as she points out, it's not been collected right where we're talking about with this wall. So maybe we can ask that, that the same studies that they did in other places along the corridor happen right where the wall is gonna be. Um, the the project area noise level um i haven't i haven't had a chance to read the whole thing but i think there's something use there's some useful information here that we could draw on mr goldman and then mr lebo uh just a couple of things to think about um if you put in a requirement that they have to come back and demonstrate that this wall doesn't have a certain sound um level you're going to have a really hard time because it will be very difficult to say that now is it the wall that's causing it and if the wall is causing it because a concrete is a harder surface than a vegetated or soiled area uh, the question is what do you do with it and we know that concrete is a harder surface than vegetated surfaces um so i would caution against but john what do you think of the box Yes. Uh, a couple of reasons. One, they only represent 
uh, right, they have different facets and they only represent a portion of the of the area of the slope because much of it is sloped uh, that doesn't have um, hard surfaces. But you, you may find yourself in this quandary of you require some sort of magic level that they're supposed to achieve after you've done, you're gonna have a difficult time. What are you gonna do with it? Um, and they're gonna be very, um, how do I say, not very friendly towards that because it's a very difficult thing to do to say that it can't exceed a certain dB level at a certain distance from the wall because they're not gonna be able to guarantee that that's gonna happen because it can be affected by a lot of things, the, including traffic. The other is that when you do sound studies, you typically don't measure the sound at, for example, the wall because that's not where people are. You measure it where people are, which could be the sidewalk across the street or in a person's backyard. And we all know that uh, the sound levels decrease based upon the distance you are from the source. So it's not typical to measure sound at the source. You measure it where it's received. So the only people that would be receiving it are the ones that are walking on the sidewalk on the other side of the street or they're standing at the bus stop. Uh, but they are considered transient rather than um, long term. So the sound levels that would be acceptable for a person standing next to a road would be a different consideration than if you're in your backyard. So I, I'm good with this. I would have a hard time if we put in a requirement that they had to measure a certain level of dB after the construction and then do something with that. Please, Larry. Uh, um, yeah, first, I'd like to thank my colleagues for uh, disagreeing with me so collegially. I, I appreciate that. Um, I think we're actually in a very similar place that where I kind of was interpreting this to imply that the applicant would have to show that there will that there's mitigation. Um, I totally I think it's totally reasonable to have a sentence like the um, director Bennett had to saying explicitly, you have to kind of show that you did some sort of study when you were designing it. Um, I can also see the logic that we should kind of focus on the design part, not kind of retro, not after it's built. But um, yeah, I, I have no objection to putting like an, uh, an explicit sentence asking for them to demonstrate what they what they've studied. An issue of, uh, of expediency here, folks, since we're, we're going to have we'll have another chance to take a look at this. We maybe uh, we can draw on some subject matter experts to try to figure out some appropriate language and skills of, of Mr. Bennett and, and Ms. Pratt and see where we fall, uh, keeping in mind that, as you and I talked about yesterday, Larry, we can't have the uh, the perfect be the enemy of the very good because we have a time constraint here. I have a new topic. Can yes. Uh, on the, on the please. Okay. So, there was one item that I was thinking about for these design guidelines in, um, how do we make it acceptable or even encourage to integrate art into an installation? I'm thinking like the roundabout at 40th Street. We're, we're, we're hoping to get some art in the middle, but if there's going to be a, a retaining wall there, can it be part of that greater art installation? And that would probably make it a little bit more lenient as to what we might anticipate the retaining wall to be if it was somehow connected to and engaged with that art project. Is there a way that you could think about that you would evaluate a project that came to you like that under this code and this guideline? Well, I, I mean, I, I think you're you're um, suggesting something that would probably have its own process uh, that, you know, if, if you're going to put public art into it, then um, you're probably going to want to expand beyond the public works director to judge whether that's appropriate art. So do you want to inject that into this this process, or do you want to, you know, kind of uh, establish that here's the look we're looking for? Um, now, I mean, it, it, in the case of a traffic circle, it, 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 that's a city project. It makes great sense to to, to do something like that. But I, I guess you know the question is, what's what's the trade off of adding uh, another process to this? Uh, because because uh, I don't think the public works director is going to be comfortable saying that's great art. You should have that. I think it's is it <laughs> yes. So the art the art selection process is a whole other ball game. But I guess I just want to know 
was there language in here that gives that flexibility? Like if they do something really unique that we don't have in here for us to be able to consider it? I, I don't think, um, yeah, it, this would stop them from doing something like that. Okay. So the question is, you know, where, are you going to, to uh, you know, create an incentive for them to do that? And and what, what did, what's entailed that? I think that I'd like to hear from the full council. Of course. That. We'll let them noodle maybe when we're back. But that one, I mostly just want to make sure it's not necessarily like strictly prohibited. Because yeah. what if they wanted a blank wall, but had a mural on it? So that was, that wouldn't be necessarily meeting these current design guidelines because we wouldn't want them to build just a blank boring wall. But if the intent is to tie it in with an additional sort of project, well, it's risky, yeah, but yeah. Uh, yeah, I, uh, Samara, I have to say, it's great that you're thinking ahead, but I think you're thinking ahead a long way. <laughs> I think it's going to be many months, if not some years before the traffic circle is ready for real attention. And I would recommend that we postpone any thoughts on that for until closer to the time um, and that we just focus on the project that's immediately in front of us right now and make sure this ordinance does everything we want for this project uh, on the 522. So um, because as I conjectured last meeting, I don't think Sound Transit's gonna wait very long before they start applying for permits, so. Yeah, and th thank you for your, your thoughts there, um, Vice Chair Cassover. And I certainly hear what you're saying, uh, Simra. I think that the, what I'm hearing Mr. Bennett say is that this would not, I don't believe that what we were looking at here would necessarily preclude mm -hmm. us from saying, as long as we're not precluding us as a community saying, hey, we'd like to have this great art installation as part of this project, you know, uh, the, I, I think I think we're okay there. And I and I do agree with my colleague here. We do have to keep our eye on the ball on this one because it's going to be, uh, and I completely agree with you when it comes to um, gateway kinds of things, roundabouts, whatever, I, that is a place that is absolutely critical for us to have aesthetically pleasing Um artwork or things like that this is a lot bigger and we have to think about i think the it's actually enormous think about what uh, if there are opportunities there you know down the corridor potentially certainly as long as we're not precluding it in our code then, then i think we're fine colleagues any other thought on on customer rule please uh, i i think if there's somebody wants to come in and present art as part of a solution i think that would be wonderful um, so whether it's an option that's available to him, I'm fine with that. I would also like to say to the audience and our citizens that uh, one good way to reduce the sound levels is to reduce the speed limit. And I certainly hope that our citizens come and support an ordinance that uh, reduces the speed limit on Bothell Way. I think that will be one good way to reduce the sound levels along Bothell. I think so, yeah. So I assume we're going to get back to this uh, on the 23rd is your next opportunity? Yes. Yeah. My understanding as well. Okay, great. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I'm sorry. I'm gonna have to. There we go. Now I can actually see the the, the red going. Um, so we haven't set a date for the council retreat. Going to try to find something for that about time wise for that coming up very soon. 
as you may recall, because of the holiday uh, coming up in two weeks, we will not have Committee of the Whole on uh, President's Day, I believe. Um, and I'll send out a couple of dates in terms of uh, potential council dinner date, as well as a uh, council retreat, which I think will be, uh, this year we'll be considering sort of a mini retreat. Um, I did receive from Councilman Riddle and Councilman Bodie, who, who couldn't be with us today because she's traveling, um, a couple of thoughts, and I will quickly just read off Councilmember Bodie's thoughts just to get them into the record. Um, just you know, too many emails just have come through here. Here we go. Um, so Councilmember Bodie had said this is not necessarily for the retreat. She wants early action on the sign ordinance, ordinance, an updated reasonable use exemption ordinance, and residential parking permit program. This is more work plan things that we'll be discussing as well. Retreat topics I'd like to recommend include, um, there's a typo here, park master planning timeline and elements, updated comp plan timeline and elements, and three, BRT community engagement and communication by the city for transparency, including for the permit processes. Boy, that went by fast. Could you just repeat that? You bet. The last one? All of them. All of them. All of them. My apologies. Um, <laughs> too much coffee today. Park master planning timeline and elements. That's her first one. Updated comp plan timeline and elements. And the third one is uh, BRT community engagement and communication by the city for transparency, including for permit processes. Um, and I believe very strongly that uh, the top topic of community engagement is going to is going to rise to the top again. That was one of our top three last year. Um, but without getting into specifics right now, which we'll reserve for future meeting. Um, and then Councilmember Riddle, did you want me to just read off this real quick? The quick items, or you go, go ahead. I'll do a quick read. I'll steal your yeah from me. Okay. Post notes. We're going to run out of notes. notes. Thank you. Yep. Um, I really want to work with uh, Seattle City Light and figure out how we can uh, improve uh, our inf uh, and. Uh, Power infrastructure, you're giving me nervous Sorry. here. Um, Kenmore did a big effort with PSC. Um, their effort included a lot of tree trimming too. So there's sort of a different, uh, but they did improve um, their power retention during storms. They'd had a lot fewer outages than we did. So there's work that can be done. We just have to start engaging with City Light and, and seeing what we can do. Uh, so that's one, it's big. Um, Two is to really look at updating the tree code to reflect any of the climate action plans recommendations that might come related to that and the tree board's recommendations, um, but also to enhance it with more of an ecosystem approach um, that includes kind of that symbiotic understory so that we're looking just a hair more holistically and we just keep growing in that, how all these things tie together. Um, and then I wanna make noticeable progress on a park. Like we have some ideas, we have some plans, I love the big master planning. I, I know we have to do that for the lakefront park, but you know, five acre woods is we're pretty far along and it's trail building. Can we get an art installation out there? Can we get their yoga platform done? Can we just make something tangible that the community can experience in a park that's a small enough bite we can do it in a year and not a big project that takes multiple years? Those are my three new ones, new Thank ideas. You. And I apologize. Um, I always like in any retreat for the first thing to do is to look back at the previous retreat and see right. what we were thinking and what we've accomplished and what's still on the list. Um, the second thing that I think we do need to um, make uh, pay some attention to is our governance manual. It is it is really out of date. There are sections of it that that we don't even really use that we're not in compliance with. So if if we're not using them and we're not in compliance with them, we ought to change them. Um, I've started on that process and will be glad to bring what I have and share it. Um, and um, 
I guess I'm pretty concerned about what's going to happen at the state legislature. So I'm thinking that we are going to have to really pay attention and take a good look at um, some of our ordinances, maybe including the town center ordinance, if that uh, uh, TOD bill goes through, we're gonna have a lot of work to do. Thank you very much, Philippa, uh, very helpful. <clears throat> Mr. Goldman. Yeah, thanks. Um, and I'll, I'll echo what I'm hearing from colleagues. I think three that I'd like to look at, uh, one would be a healthy streets pilot where we have the streets that are closed for pedestrian access only like Seattle has done. Um, a second, and this would also kind of depend on what happens out of Olympia, but to take a look at our ADU ordinance, we did some ADU reforms last year and just to see how are they working, what's working well, what could be, continue to be improved. And then a third would be looking at um, some sort of property tax levy and getting community engagement. Um, something, you know, might we do something like what Shoreline has uh, with their five-year plan, but make sure that we're from the ground, we have community engagement so that it does a lot better than, than you know, Prop 1 failed badly. So getting community on board with levies and explaining our budget situation. Thank you, Larry. Just to follow up on Council Member Goldman's comment, um, think of it as um, a community advisory financial stabilization plan, and that it really begins with community uh, involvement and suggestions to look at our long term finances and get them engaged in consideration of what our expenditures and revenues are, so that they can help um, give us suggestions, but also help build that community involvement. Tracy. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, and uh, one of the advantages of going last is that everybody said a lot of things I was already going to say, <laughs> so I could go down to the lower priority stuff on my list. Um, so I appreciate basically the comments about the fiscal health and about the governance manual. Those, those are two things that had been concerning me. Um, for our part, um, yeah, working on the climate action plan, including uh, starting with the low hanging fruit, like banning natural gas and multifamily and commercial construction, uh, working on our, so that's one. The um, second priority would be um, basically uh, working on our bikeability, walkability plan. So that includes uh, negotiating for the McKinnon Creek Trail to finally happen and or converting uh, Perkins Way to a one-way street with a dedicated bikeway walkway. And then my third priority is um, uh, paying attention to the diversity that we have in this town. So in that, um, we had been talking about honoring Octavia Butler in some way. And also basically looking at removing the racial covenants in our uh, chain of title uh, documents. Thank you very much, Tracy. Other thoughts? And I can chime in here too, the benefit of going last, really, <laughs> truly last. <laughs> uh, actually, you all have covered so many of the things here. We're going, there's a lot here uh, and we have a very, very, full schedule. Um, so the retreat is going to be a place where we're going to have to, to prioritize. And, and uh, But thematically, there's a lot of things here. The governance manual absolutely is something that we've been meaning, we've been talking about. Uh, I too have been accumulating all these different edits that, that we need to put into place. And I think it may be, we'll have to figure out a, a way to move that forward and maybe tangentially a small small group uh, get together and, and, and make that happen. Um, the uh, the question of housing, I, I believe similarly, uh, the middle housing bills and as well as the the uh, TOD uh, aspects of some of the bills that are right now in the midst of uh, being discussed down in Olympia, we have to monitor that very, very carefully. I know the administration is doing it as well as our, our lobbyists are. Um, and uh, I, I do appreciate the lens that you're talking about looking at it through Philippa, you know, uh, looking at these things and thinking about where do we need to pivot in terms of figuring out um, changes to our own code relative to uh, depending on what happens down there, in addition to going down there and uh, expressing our viewpoints, um, which will happen next month, I'm, I'm assuming, as well as on an ongoing basis. Um, I appreciate what Mr. Lebo said about a community uh, financial action plan. I really, I really believe um, convening a group of citizens, regardless of the question of what the outcome is, I think it's important to continue that 
theme of engagement that we we really worked on um, emphasizing last year, but because of the fact that we came out of the pandemic sort of um, and kind of bumped along there, there wasn't the opportunity to have the engagement that we that we really, I know you're all committed to as I certainly am. So I'd like to see community engagement um, on a number of things, financial questions, as well as uh, uh, immediate community, uh, uh, in the immediate future, community engagement on what's going on with sound transit as well. Uh, I think that that's something that's absolutely critical. Um, and I recognize that sound transit is, is going to be helping us to a certain degree, but we need it from our perspective. Um, and uh, let's see. I think that's pretty much where I am. The, I mean, again, the climate action plan to implementation of that is critical. Uh, looking at the diversity in our community is essential. And multimodal, and again, we already teed up um, speed limits and traffic calming last year. We've got to continue that good work. And that is a great segue into healthy streets. Uh, both Council Member Riddle and Council Member Goldman have been championing that, like Seattle's model, which I think is an outstanding one. Um, uh, and, and also uh, Mr. Fertani's comments about um, multimodal, pedestrian and bicycle friendly access. Um, that's something that we're going to be discussing um, on an ongoing basis. So these are really good things to think about. And then we'll be distilling them down as, again into the, the big sort of the big themes and then figuring out what where we have in terms what we have in terms of the capacity based upon the fact that we have the comp plan, we have pre-code revisions, we have a serious amount of code revisions that are coming as well. And and it goes without saying, you guys said don't talk about that too much. So I'm, I'm going to let you talk about speed limits. Yes. <laughs> um, not that I'm ever wanting to talk about speed limits, but speed limits, I think, uh, too, um, is we're going to be a critical component um, of this year's discussions. So other thoughts? Well, Councilman Riddle. Just to, I guess, six, the um, need for, for community engagement. Um, I think we had really good uh, interest in la at last year's retreat, but we just never quite were able to get it off the ground. I think there's still some concerns, pandemic and stuff, but we're seeing people come back. We're seeing a need, we're seeing an engagement, we're seeing a willingness, I think, to bring in, um, you know, listening sessions and other methods to hear from our community that's outside the three minute uh, public comment. And that maybe is less structured on topic that just lets us listen to them in a really open and engaging way. I think we're all really excited about that, but it just wasn't the right time. And I think now this year is the right time. And I agree with my colleagues on that. And I'd be remiss if I didn't uh, acknowledge um, Vice Chair Cassover's comment about reflecting back. Mm -hmm. How are things working? How is our ADU ordinance working? How, or you've actually said that would said it earlier today. I yeah. guess. She actually said this at an early meeting. Sorry, I'm conflating meetings, Larry. My apologies. Um, and I think that that is really important for us to do as part of the process. How is the tree ordinance going? How is the ADU ordinance? Are we encouraging the what we're look what the community has asked us to codify? Um, and what are those metrics? So, again, without overburdening staff or anything else, we can get some baseline, uh, you know, some basic understandings of whether it's successful, uh, whether it's a tree ordinance or whether it's the ADU ordinance or whether it's, uh, you know, and, and hopefully soon to be determined the speed limit uh, changes that we're looking for. Um, because we did pivot with the tree ordinance a number of years ago and had to revise it um, because it it was, it was a first shot at it and it didn't work so great. Some ways it worked really well, but we had to uh, pivot and and revise it and and since then, while it's not it, it's not perfect by any stretch of the imagination, it's a lot better than it was, and 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 a leader in the state. So uh, that remains. Uh, um, I also think about the plastics ordinance. So I'd be remiss if I didn't mention that as well. Colleagues, thoughts? We're at seven thirty-one. I I'm one minute over my allotted time here. And you have to stand up. I know. Are you all right? Please. Any other thoughts before we? Uh, Call it for the evening. And the last thing I just wanted to say really quickly is uh, to, uh, we are going to be talking about speed limits of traffic calming at the work session on Thursday. 
just to let you know. Mr. Mayor or City Administrator Hill? Okay. Well, thank you, everybody. Appreciate it. And uh, I won't use the gavel. We're adjourned. <laughs> thank you. Thanks for coming, you guys. Thanks, Thanks for coming. I think, yeah, that. Okay.